The National Broadcasting Company presents, transcribes, Sir Lawrence Olivier in Theatre Royal. Good evening. Today's play, and our last in this series, is based on a story which is forever haunting to me by Paul Gallico. It's of the Second World War, and I think it may already be familiar to you. I myself shall play the part of Philip Ryader and tell you Paul Gallico's story, The Snow Goose. The Great Marsh lies on the Essex coast between the village of Chelmbury and the ancient Saxon oyster fishing hamlet of Wickel Drove. It is one of the last of the wild places of England. A low, far reaching expanse of grass and reeds and half submerged meadowlands ending in the great saltings and mud flats and tidal pools near the restless sea. The marsh is desolate, utterly lonely and made lonelier by the calls and cries of the wild fowl that make their homes in the salting. The wild geese and the gulls, the teal, the widgeon, the red shanks and curlews that pick their ways through the tidal pools. Like a lonely sentinel in the emptiness, there stands the squat white ruin of an abandoned lighthouse, close by the mouth of the river Elder. Lately, it has served again as a human habitation. It is the home of a man, a hunchback, but a man who creates great beauty, the painter, Philip Ryader. Just a touch more. Mm. Mm, bring up the... Mm. Yeah, perhaps one more silhouette to carry you over from one to the other, like that. Yeah, like that, huh? Good Lord, company? Who the devil can that be? First visitor in over two years. Hmm, wait a minute. Where's that rag? Ah. Well, good heavens. What have you got there, child? A goose? Oh, I found it, sir. It's hurted. Is it still alive? Yes. Yes, I think so. Come in, child, come in. Where did you find it? In Marsh, sir, where parlors had been. Huh? What is it, sir? Well, it's a, it's a snow goose from Canada. How in all heaven did it get here? It's been shot by fowlers. Can he eat it, sir? <laughs> yes, I think so. Anyway, we'll try. Come along, you can help me. There are some scissors and bandages in that cupboard over there. All right. Now, let's get a proper look at that. All right, all right. We're not going to hurt you. are just trying to help you, that's all. You know that, don't you? Now then. Hmm. Yes, she'd been shot all right, poor thing. Her legs broken, and the wings tipped, but not badly. Now, if we just clip her primaries so that we can bandage it... Yeah, that's better. Now we can see what we're doing. Will she be able to fly again? Oh, oh yes. These primaries, these, these big wing feathers, they'll grow in the spring. And then she'll be able to fly as well as ever. But I'm going to bandage the wing close to the body so that she can't move it until it's set, you see? Now we'll have to make a splint for a poor leg. Shall I hold her, sir? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You hold her while I find a splint among this firewood here. Well, um, these twigs will do, I think. Mm, I have to be a bit stronger than that. Mm. After all, she's a big bird, isn't she? Aye. It were all I could do to pick her up and carry her to him. Yes, it must have been. Why'd you bring her into me, I wonder? Mm. I heard tell that, that he keeps birds in cages and feeds them and looks after them and won't let no one go shooting at them in your land. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm fond of birds. I like looking after them. Where did she come from, did you say? From Canada. That's a land far, far across the seas. A beautiful daughter of England. She's quite a young bird. No more than a year old, I'd say. She's born up there in northern Canada, and when she flew south to escape the, the snow and ice and bitter cold, a great storm must have seized her and whirled and buffeted her about. At last, exhausted by her ordeal, she sank to rest in this friendly green marsh. 
only to be shot at by a hunter's gun. Bitter reception for a visiting princess. Is she really a princess? Oh, of course she is. A princess among birds. We'll call her La Princesse Perdue. The lost princess. In a few days, you'll be feeling much better, won't you, princess? See, what, what you'll eat up this grain I've got for her. Why, the poor princess must be nearly starving. Oh, oh, look, <laughs> she's gobbling it all out of your hand. <laughs> I must be going. Oh, well, well, no, wait a minute. Um, what's your name, child? Fred. Eh? Oh, Fretha, I suppose. Well, where do you live? We're fishing folk in Wicked Rock. Oh, well, 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 will you come back to see how the princess is getting along? Hi. Huh. Well, goodbye. I wonder. Probably she'd be afraid of me, just like all the others. An ogre. Hunchback with a withered claw of a hand. But the child, Frith, or Fritha, came back. She overcame her fear of Ryan. Her imagination was captured by the presence of this strange white princess from a land far across the sea. Ryder had shown her the land on a map. It was pink all over. And on the map, they had traced the stormy path of the lost bird from its home in Canada to the great marsh of Essex. But now that the winter was over, the snow goose was quite well again. It had been limping about the enclosure with the wild pink-footed geese by Christmas time. And now that it was June again, I had told her that it would fly away. Yes. Very soon we shall see the last of our princess, Frith. Aren't you sorry? I Must she go then? Yes. Her instinct will call her back to Canada now that the summer has come again. That is, if she can ever fly back to Canada when she leaves here. Couldn't we stop her flying away? Oh, yes, we could. But you wouldn't want us to do that, would you? Don't you want her to feel free? Free to go where she wants to be? Free to do what she wants to do? We don't want to make the princess a prisoner, do we? No. No. Now, look at these pink feet there. They're so fat and well-fed, they've got quite lazy. All their friends have migrated north weeks ago. Go on! Go on! Off with you! Off to the royal! Go on! Off to the north! After your friends! Oh, shh! Look, <laughs> they're going! Just like you told them to. <laughs> The princess, she's going with them. She's flying away. Come back, princess. Come back. Ah, the princess is going home. Listen, she's bidding us farewell. With the departure of the snow goose, ended the visits of Frith to the lighthouse. Ryada learned all over again the meaning of the word loneliness. That summer, out of his memory, he painted a picture of a slender, grime-covered child, her hair, her fair hair, blown by the November storm, who bore in her arms a wounded white bird. And then in mid-October, a miracle occurred. Ryada was in his enclosure feeding his birds. A grey northeast wind was blowing and the land was sighing beneath the coming tide. Above the sea and the wind noises, he heard a high, clear note. He turned his eyes upward to the evening sky in time to see first an infinite speck, then a black and white winged dream that circled the lighthouse once, and finally a reality that dropped to earth in the pen and came waddling forward importantly to be fed, as though she had never been away. It was the snow goose. But where has she been all summer then in Canada? Who knows? Perhaps. No, I, I think she must have summered in Greenland or Spitsbergen with the pink feet. And she must have remembered us and returned to see us. Oh, good, kind princess. Coming back to see us all that way. Yes. You see, it means that she isn't afraid of us anymore. Not even afraid of me, Frith. No. <laughs> Are you, Frith? No. Ah, not like you were that time, just a year ago, when you first brought the wounded princess home to me? No. Ah, <laughs> I'm glad, Frith. 
And now we shall have the princess with us all through the winter again. And not until next spring will she fly away again and leave us. Each winter, the snow goose returned and stayed. The world outside boiled and seethed and rumbled with rumors of a coming war. For these were the 1930s. But the rumors meant little to Ryder or Frith. When the snow goose was at the lighthouse, Frith came too. She sailed with Ryder and the little sailboat he handled so skillfully despite his withered arm. They caught wildfowl together for their ever-increasing colony and built new pens and enclosures to house them till the summer took them north once more. But when that happened, and the princess herself flew off once more, it was as though some kind of bar was between them. Frith herself stayed away. And Ryada was alone again. The war came to England. And six weeks later, the snow goose returned from the outer darkness of the north. With her, Frith returned as well. But only after another month had gone by. And when she came, Ida, with a shock, realized that she was a child no longer. In just a few short months, she had grown up into a shy young woman. Seventeen. So you must have been thirteen when you came here first with the wounded princess. Yes. Mm. Seems a long time ago, doesn't it? <laughs> a long time ago. All the way between childhood and being grown up, Frith. Mr. Ryder? No, let's not have Mr. Ryder with us anymore, shall we? I call you Frith. Now you're old enough to call me Philip. Or will that seem very strange to you? I don't think so, Philip. No, it doesn't even sound strange to me. Almost as though it always should have been, Philip. Oh, look. More planes going to Germany. Yes. More planes. More death. Perhaps that's why the birds are leaving too early this spring. They're afraid of the planes. Yes, they're leaving us to fend for ourselves. Planes and bombs. No wonder they're frightened. Here it is only the first of May and the last of the pink feet have gone already. So over the barnacle geese, all are leaving us. Philip, look. The snow goose. The princess, she's going too. Oh, no. What is she going? Oh, she's flying too low for that. She isn't rising at all, just slowly circling the lighthouse, getting the feel of her wings. But look, she's settling again. Princess, you're going to stay with us. Yes, she'll stay. She'll <laughs> never go away again. The lost princess is lost no more. This is her home now, of her own free will, Philip. Philip, I, I must go back. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, Fred. Till, till tomorrow. I'm glad the princess will stay. You'll not be so alone now. Oh, well, goodbye, Frith. Oh, I won't be so alone now. Oh. I wonder. In a moment, we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. Fine Sunday entertainment continues with a dramatic series, Inheritance, tonight. The Mountain Men is the offering of the evening and tells the story of Hugh Glass, one of a small band of hunters and trappers who crossed the Missouri and helped open up the West. You'll enjoy this entry in the regular Sunday night series, presented in cooperation with the American Legion. That's Inheritance, tonight. Meet the Press then brings you another prominent guest, who answers the barrage of pertinent questions fired by a panel of top newspaper reporters. Lawrence Spivak is moderator. And here is a checklist of some of the Monday through Friday standouts. Every weekday morning, there's laughs and variety listening to Brighton household chores. We mean Bob, the housewife's friend, Hope, who entertains guest stars, plus his outstanding woman of the week. Tomorrow, he salutes Edna E. Prevost of Pueblo, Colorado, who has given four years of voluntary aid to displaced persons in her community. 
The comedian will also interview interesting personalities from the studio audience, read some true funny stories from listeners, and engage in a few verbal jousts with announcer straight man Bill Goodwin. So put a little hope into your daytime listening tomorrow. And don't forget all the other daily regulars. Pauline Frederick, award-winning analyst, provides commentary on international and United Nations news. Also in the current events department, there is Three Star Extra with Ray Henley, Ned Brooks, and a guest expert. Alex Dreyer, your newsman on the go. Morgan Beatty with a roundup of world happenings, plus a staff of specialists who join Jim Fleming in bringing you the heart of the news. Then you'll want to pay your nightly visit to all the friendly folks at 79 Wistful Vista, the home of Fibber McGee and Molly, where you just might bump into Wallace Whipple, Doc Gamble, and the old-timer. Sound like some interesting listening? Always is on NBC. And now we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. It was a little more than three weeks before Frith returned to the lighthouse. May was at its end, and the day, too, in a long golden twilight that was giving way to the silver of the moon already hanging in the eastern sky. She told herself, as her steps took her thither, that she must know whether the snow goose had really stayed, as Ryder had said it would. Perhaps it had flown away, after all. But her firm tread on the sea wall was full of eagerness, and sometimes unconsciously she found herself hurrying. As she approached the lighthouse, she saw the yellow light of Ryder's lantern down by his little wharf. His sailboat was rocking gently on the flooding tide, and he was loading supplies into her, water and food and bottles of brandy, gear and a spare sail. Philip, you're going away? Frith! Oh, I'm glad you came. Yes, yes, I must go away. A, a little trip. I'll come back, never fear. But where must you go? Over the channel to Dunkirk. Over the channel? You mean to France? Uh, yes, it's only about, uh, about a hundred miles. You mean where the fighting is? Uh, well... You're, you're going to the war. Well, in a way, yes. Uh, you've heard the news about Dunkirk? Only what they say, but our soldiers are fighting there. Yeah, well, they can't fight any longer, Frith. They're, they're trapped. The Germans in front of them and the sea behind them. They're out on the sands there, a whole army without weapons, without any cover, waiting for the German advance. The port's in flames, the position's hopeless for them. The whole army, you see, trapped out there, helpless. But what can you do for them, Philip? You'll be killed too. Oh, no, I shan't. I hope. All the men with boats in Chelmbury are putting out, and the little ships along the whole coast, all going over to help get the men back to England. The government has made an appeal. Every tug or fishing boat or launch that can get there heading across the channel to take the men off the beaches. But it's madness. They'll all be killed. Oh. What can they do? Well, they, they can do something. Get the men off the beaches to the transports and destroyers that are standing offshore that can't get into the shallows, you see. That, well, that's what I can do. Six or seven men at a time. Get them off the beaches. Philip, must you go? You, you'll not come back. Why must it be you? Oh, no. Listen, Fred. Those men are huddled on the beaches like hunted birds. You know, the wounded and the hunted birds we used to find and bring into the sanctuary. Over them are flying the planes like steel peregrines, hawks and gerfalcons. There's no shelter in which to hide. They're lost and storm-driven and harried, like the lost princess was when you found her and brought her to me from the marshes that time we healed her. You remember? You're, you're not... You're bad arm, oh, Philip. But this is something I can do. You know I can just for once, I can be a man and play my part. I'll come with you, Philip. No, no, no. Your, your place in the boat would cause a soldier to be left behind, and another, and another. No, I, I must oh, go alone. Philip, please. No, goodbye, my dear. Now, will you look after the birds until I return? Yes, I'll take care of them. Godspeed, Philip. God bless you, Frith. It was night now, bright with moon fragment and stars and northern glow. Frith stood on the seawall and watched the sail gliding down the swollen estuary. Suddenly from the darkness behind her, there came a rush of wings and something swept past her into the air. In the night light, she saw the flash of white wings, black tipped, and the thrust forward head of the snow goose. It rose and cruised over the lighthouse once and then headed down the winding creek where Ryder's sail was slanting in the gaining breeze and flew above him in slow, wide circles. Princess, oh, princess, watch over him. Watch 
over him. Hey, you all right, mate? Uh, hey, blimey, look at that. Bloody great bird flying in to all that muck and stink. Look at it. Well, what is it? A swan or something? No, it's a ruddy goose. Here, yeah, look at it, circling round like it was a dive bomber. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we're done for. It's the angel of death, had to pick us up. Nah, not it. It's a ruddy goose come over with a message from Churchill, <laughs> asking how we like the bathing over here. <laughs> yeah, it's a good omen, that's what it is. We'll get out of here yet, mate, you mark my words. We won't get out unless some perisher comes and picks us all up, and that's the honest truth. Yeah, here comes a chap that's going to take us there. Look. That little sailing boat coming round through the smoke there. Oh, look at him. Sailing along as cool as you please, like a blooming top out for a pleasure spin on a Sunday afternoon at Anley. Run. Look at the bullets whipping the water up all round him. I hope he makes it. That's where they sank the Ramsgate motorboat this morning. Oh, we'll make it, never you fear. Chap that's as cool as that'll make anything. Yeah, he's into the shallows now. Look out! Another of the jitters! Get down! Yeah. No, they didn't get him. They didn't get him. He's going to make it. Oh, look at him now. A black beard, humped back, and a sort of claw for his hand. It's old Nick himself. We must be dead and we don't know it. Yeah, it's more like the good lord he looks to me. Like the pictures in the Sunday school books. White face, dark eyes, beard and all. And his blooming boat. I can take seven at a time. Good man. The seven are the nearest. Get in. Uh, you fall off. You and you men over there. What, us, sir? Yes, you fool. Don't stand there staring. Get in, quick. Yes, sir. Well, oh. come on, Lofty. Okay. This is it. Come on, lad. In you get. Right. And don't mind getting your feet wet. Here we are. Right. Mind your heads when I swing around. In fact, keep down in the bottom of the boat, all of you. Blimey. Look at that ruddy goose flying round and round. Told you it was a good omen. It's a blinking angel of mercy. That's what it is. When he had brought his boatload out to the Kentish maze, Ryder sailed back to the shore for seven more survivors, and all that day he sailed back and forth. A motorboat from the Thames Yacht Club had come to help in the job, and then a lifeboat from Poole, until the Kentish maid had 700 souls aboard her. And when she sailed back to England, Ryder waved from his little sailboat, and the snow goose flew circling overhead. It was four days later that a Limehouse tug was sailing back across the channel, towing four barges full of the last survivors from Dunkirk Beach. Can you make out what she is? Seems to be a dead man lashed to the mast, sir. We'll stop it. He may only be wounded. What's that bird on a rail, for heaven's sake? Looks like a goose. Hey, it is, sir. The goose has been flying over the beaches during the whole evacuation. It becomes a sort of legend among the men. Some of those I brought back yesterday in the trawler had seen it. They said if you saw the flying wild goose, you'd be saved. It's a sort of good luck omen. The wild goose? That one looks tame. Almost like a pet that he'd brought over with him. Floating mine on the port bow! A mine? Look, mister, right in our course. Do you realize if we hadn't stopped, we'd probably have hit it? Aye, it's more than likely, sir. Looks as though we were lucky to see the goose. Haul that boat in. Is he dead? Dead, sir. Machine gun. Nothing else aboard except the goose. Can't take it off. It attacks you every time you come near it. Very good. Tell them in the last barge. I want that mine detonated before it does any damage. Mine 30 yards to port, sink at the stern of the last barge. Oh, yeah, Jeff. I wonder who, who he was, poor devil. Probably someone who'd come over from Dover or somewhere. Stayed to the very end and then killed on the way back. Ah, the goose didn't bring him any luck, mister. No, poor beggar. Nice shooting back there. Well, there's one mine that won't do any more damage. Look, the resale boat. It's sinking. A concussion. Yes, he's going. And the man with her. And there goes the goose. 
circling round like a plane, saluting. Once, twice, three times. Now, flying back to England. It'll bring bad news to someone, I'm afraid. When Ryder had sailed away, Fritha had remained alone at the little lighthouse on the Great Marsh, taking care of the birds, waiting for she knew not what. The first days she haunted the seawall, watching, though she knew it was useless. Later, she roamed through the storerooms of the lighthouse where Ryder had stacked his canvas in. There she came across the picture that Ryder had painted of her from memory when she was still a child. The picture and all she saw in it stirred her as nothing had before, for much of Ryder's soul had gone into it. And now Fritha knew in her blood, had known from the moment he sailed away that Ryder would not return. And so, when one sunset she heard the high-pitched, well-remembered note cried from the heavens, it brought no instant of false hope to her heart. This moment, it seemed, she had lived before many times. She came running to the sea wall, turned her eyes not toward the distant channel whence a sail might come, but in the sky, from whose flaming arches plummeted the snow goose. Then the sight, the sound, and the solitude surrounding broke the dam within her and released the surging overwhelming truth of her love. Let it well forth in tears. Oh, Philip. Philip, I love you. I love you, Philip. For a moment, she thought the snow goose was going to land in the old enclosure. But it only skimmed low, then soared up again, flew in a wide, graceful spiral once round the old light, and then began to climb. Watching it, she saw no longer the snow goose, but the soul of Ryada taking farewell of her before departing forever. 